Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Happy Thursday. Welcome to our Natural Health News Live Show. I'm Dr. Melissa Gallagher. For all of you new joining, I want to welcome you to our community here at Natural Health Resources. This show is a daily Natural Health News Live Show, particularly the first half of our show. We talk about news and information related to coronavirus and COVID-19. And I know a lot of us, and to be honest with you, so I'm reporting on it daily. I'm getting tired as well of this virus, but it is here. It's here to stay at least through the year. And we're looking at this being a part of our lives for at minimum 18 months or longer. So I want to welcome you all. And I'm going to share with you a whole bunch of news. I've got some articles and you know, some news reports and some data I'm going to share with you. I think you're going to find interesting. And then today's topic, oh, I'm not mic'd up. Sorry, YouTube. Hold on one second. Sometimes I forget my sequencing of things here. Okay, so hold on. Good news is my mic works, even if it's not totally on. Okay, so you guys should hear me better. Um, so today, the topic of our show after the news is about biohacking and uh, nootropics, particularly. I get a lot of questions on this, and actually one of my favorite um, brands that, that I've highlighted to you all several times uh, throughout this live show and then also on other videos. Um, Healthy Cell just came out with a new uh, biohacking nootropic product. So I'm going to share with you my experiences with this, but also dig into what biohacking is. And particularly, there's all different types of biohacking and methodologies and severity in terms of how intense people go. But the good news is if you are sitting here watching either here on the live show or on a replay and you have any type of pre-existing health condition like diabetes, high blood pressure, maybe you're dealing with obesity or weight gain, weight loss challenges, you might be dealing with anxiety, stress, mental focus challenges, depression, mental, the mental health component. Also with the isolation and separation and social distancing, a lot of us are feeling more depressive symptoms than we even recognize. Um, and then also if you're dealing with any autoimmunity from rheumatoid arthritis, Scho Sjogren's disease, Hashimoto's, NS, um, and as well as any of the other autoimmune challenges like uh, RA, and fibromyalgia, this video, this particular topic of biohacking is going to be impactful for you. I promise you it's very impactful. I'm going to share with you a few tools that you can consider in your health and wellness arsenal, um, particularly this particular nootropic being one of them, but we'll dig into what bio biohacking is. I don't know if I have a large biohacking population, but if you follow Ben Greenfield, he is the master of this. And I have been interviewed by some of the same documentarians who've interviewed him and have a lot of people we know in common. So I'm excited to dig further into this. But welcome, everybody. Tell me where you're tuning in from. We've got Candy's Girl. Hi, it's good to see you. And Pau and Lois over in Hawaii. Just want to say hi, hi to everybody. Sheila's on board. And uh, let's see, we've got a whole bunch of other friends on board. So welcome. Oh, we have, already have a super chat. Oh, Peter down in Australia. Thank you, Peter. You're so sweet. So thank you. And we have Lorenzi Aim. I hope I said that right. In London, we always have an international community. So welcome to all of you. And thanks, Peter, for the live super chat. I'm grateful. So let's dig into some of our news. Uh, yesterday, obviously, we um, have surpassed 100,000 deaths here in the U.S., most importantly, in the world, we're at 5.6, almost 5.7 million cases. The U.S. is at 1.7 million. And two countries I want to highlight that we are monitoring. Most notably, Brazil has had a significant increase. They are having that New York-style daily increase right now. They are at 414,000 cases, almost 14, 4,000, 4,000 or 415,000. <laughs> and they had 20,000, over 20,000 new cases just in one day. So they're in full growth mode. And Russia moved up to 379,000. And um, as far as the US cases, 
I'm happy to report we have 370,000 cases who have recovered. Woo, those are people they've, you know, run bells and they do, you know, different dances in the ICU after they get uh, the in unintubated, the tubes come out, they come off of uh, the ventilation, they're breathing on their own, they're on the path to recovery. That doesn't mean that they're completely stable, but definitely uh, the recovered uh, numbers are folks that have fully recovered. They've tested negative twice and, and are well on their way. There may be some complications though. We just are going to have to see what happens after people get infected with this, how it impacts them. The other thing that I wanna note is that um, current state active cases, so people who are actively in an immune war within their body, and their bodies are fighting the coronavirus, it's 100, it's 1.2 million individuals. So we have 1,262,000 1, cases that are currently in fighting mode. So we're, you know, that's significant. Those individuals, when they're fighting it, they're contagious, they're in the hospital setting, the majority of them, but there are others that are convalescing at home. So I want to highlight a follow-up to yesterday and re early reporting I had here about the testing counts for states not being uh, reliable. In fact, the testing counts were being inflated. And this is significant because all of the states are using data, you know, the data. And I say in quotes because right now we know at least in uh, over a dozen states, the data is not 100% in terms of its accuracy. So um, we even have further information I'm going to share with you. So comment down below if you live in Georgia, Illinois, or Florida. Many of you know we are here in Atlanta, just north of the city in a suburb in northwest Atlanta. I grew up in Florida. I started my business in Florida. I went to undergrad in Florida. So Florida is definitely, Florida and Georgia are two states I'm, I'm honing in on. And we have news on both of those states. So Georgia, uh, they got a lot of flack. I removed the, the chart off my desk yesterday, but they got a lot of flack because they were altering the actual chart that showed it. They altered it, this chart, the data to show that there was a decline. That actually wasn't true. They got called out. The bottom level access for the chart was incorrect. And they were manipulating days to show decrease. Well, it's even more substantial than that. Georgia has been underestimating the actual hospitalizations. So the count of hospitalized COVID cases are only documented with the state if those patients are in the hospital when they get their COVID test and they get the diagnosis. So they get the nasal swab serum test, whatever of the tests that comes back positive and they're in the hospital. That is the actual reporting number that the state of Georgia has, which means we don't know the number, the true accurate number of COVID-19 hospitalizations. That is significant, okay? So that's just Georgia. Okay, now we're gonna move to Florida. Florida's in a hot mess. Georgia's admitted their fault. It was so blatant and obvious when people were tweeting out like your X access has, you know, moving from April 27th to like May 7th. And, you know, just that was just so blatant. I don't, it's like a child stealing candy and having chocolate on their hands and their face. So Florida is still in this denial mode. They've had uh, a whistleblower quit and call called out the state for trying to manipulate data in May. Well, now we know that the health department, the, the Florida health department, so the state-run health department has been trying to suppress the COVID death count by Florida medical examiners. And the, the tally uh, of the medical examiners is actually higher than the death rate or, or not the death rate, the death toll that the state was reporting. And so they are trying to, they're trying to go with the, the smallest number. The challenge here, and I've highlighted this a bit, and it's, it's something that is localized and different based on every state, every county, every city. There might be a medical examiner or a coroner, or it might be somebody that's handling this in a hospital or nursing home. And those there's a methodology to reporting deaths. And so this is not anything new. This is how you get a death certificate. If any of you have dealt with that, you know, sometimes it can be a pain in the butt. 
and take a while for the processing. So the, in Florida, the medical examiners are the ones who uh, dictate the cause of death. Well, that cause of death is being dictated as COVID through autopsies, post you know, uh, death testing, wh- whatever methodology it's getting identified. And we do know that their COVID is just not respiratory. Um, it causes blood clots. It's causing heart failure, heart uh, arrhythmias. It causes all sorts of other symptoms or systems. And the cause of death might be from that symptom, a heart attack a blood clot, a stroke. And it's a tricky situation. COVID causes that, but the true cause of death might be the actual heart attack. They're also charting that it's a COVID related death and the state does not want that. Okay. So that's one state. Then Illinois, um, they are limiting the public reporting of the nursing home cases and Chicago is in, they're still in spiking mode. And we're seeing some some cities and some areas are having the greatest numbers of cases. So we're seeing movement in certain pockets, um, which is pretty crazy. So I'm getting a lot of reaction there. It is pretty substantial um, in terms of that. And Powell is right, you know, Georgia has had a 10% increase in cases. Part of me wonders, are we reporting it correctly now? Are we dealing with outbreaks? I mean, that is the challenge here. When we don't have the right input of data, how do we analyze what's accurate? And is 10% the accurate reporting, you know, the increase in reporting, or is this truly an outbreak? But I will say, yesterday I reported that there, I think it was yesterday. Let me check my notes. So the one thing I reported, actually I reported on Tuesday. Um, so there was, so on Tuesday I reported, if you guys watch the show here in North, um, let's see, Northwest Atlanta, South of where we live, but it, a a burb of, of Atlanta, just kind of Northwest of Buckhead. If you guys are familiar with Buckhead, um, there was a private school that held a drive-through graduation ceremony. One of the students, obviously we don't know male or female, but one of the students did the drive-through graduation process. They had COVID. They didn't know it. They weren't tested, but they either were asymptomatic or shedding the the respiratory droplets, or they started to feel symptoms. We're not quite clear on that, but one person was involved in this drive-through graduation. That individual through contact tracing and knowing what they're, what they, who all they contacted with after graduation, they had a party at their, uh, family's home, you know, small, but decent sized graduation party. Then the student went out of town with their friends. Okay. So positive student. We now have three cases that were reporting yesterday. We've had even more, uh, because of this one situation. This is where one of those situations where one could turn into three, it turns into nine. And then all of a sudden we've got in a burb of Atlanta, just explosion. And The challenge here is that these students, they're all together. They all went out of town. They've put a lot of people at risk. So that's what we're dealing with in Florida or in Georgia. Um, So that's, that's kind of the situation there in some reporting and metrics with regard to the numbers. The other thing I want to highlight is, uh, this is really important, and I will, I promise I'll post this. This came out of, I want to say this was The Lancet. Okay, so I've, I've read a ton of research recently, uh, last time this morning. <laughs> Finally, more stuff's coming out I can share with you. So The Lancet, uh, in combination with the um, LSU, so University, so LSU, so University, um, and their their, the medical center that LSU is a part of and their medical school. So it's the New Orleans School of Medicine. They did autopsies on 10 um, COVID patients. All of them were African-Americans. And the identifying factor was that all of them presented with a particular biomarker called D-dimers. And this is a biomarker of inflammation. And it's also what is being analyzed in the children's cases. That's one of the multiple lab tests. What they've identified, all 10 of these African-American individuals, ages 44 to 78, 
They had the cause of death attributed to COVID-19. They're all of them died of um, blood clots in their lungs. So it wasn't heart failure or heart attack or stroke. It was a pulmonary multitude, multiple pulmonary embolism. So multiple small and larger, so micro clots and larger blood clots in the lungs. And very, very significant in terms of three key underlying factors for all 10 of these individuals. They had high blood pressure, they had diabetes, and they were all obese. And I don't know what categorization, I don't recall it linking, but they, I mean, this is one of the things that they did the, the, you know, I'm, I'm going to show you pictures. These are the pathology lung tissue. And so they've identified the degree of the blood clotting. And they also put it under a microscope. I don't know if, if you guys can see this. There's a black dot right there. That's a clot. That's like a micro clot. That is enough to kill somebody um, and to cause a degree of trauma. And there, there are series of microclots. Like, I don't know if, how well this registers, but there are like three or four dots in this one tissue space. So, um, but this, this is significant because um, this gives us a better idea of what we call thrombosis. So the blood clotting. Um, within the small vessels and capillaries of the lungs. That is what the respiratory impact uh, of COVID is when it relates to the blood clotting disorder. Um, so this, I think, is very impactful. Um, there are no secondary infections related to any of these individuals. Um, and they do see and show certain immune-related, that, that kind of cytokine storm response. So I think this is important. This is really also key because we are seeing greater quantities of our, our black Americans, so African Americans who are being hospitalized in greater quantities. I reported yesterday the Bronx, you know, significant quantity of individuals that are probably also having these scenarios up in New York as well. So that's something that's very telling. I'm happy to see this reported. I think it's really important that, uh, you know, moving forward, we really target how to, to manage the blood pressure, manage diabetes, and really limit the levels of obesity in these populations because these underlying health conditions cause greater inflammation. And one of the things with obesity, and this really gets drawn out in the study, when we have obesity, we have a certain type of fat tissue, and that fat tissue actually causes and releases certain inflammatory cells. So part of today's topic about biohacking and nootropics is also combined with reducing inflammation levels. And so we can achieve some of that reduction by utilizing some of these hacks. The other news, there's just a lot of news to report, friends. So, um, you know, schools are looking at different options for the, the fall. We as a family are looking at options. I'll say I didn't get any time yesterday to do anything other than mommy camp. And I didn't even post photos, but mommy camp was pretty much success. We had two or three major cries and, and freak outs this morning. We were up way too early, already have had two big cries and uh, I'm exhausted. <laughs> so homeschooling is going to be a trip, but we're testing it out in our family as are a lot of parents trying to figure out what are they going to do? One of the things that schools are trying to figure out most importantly is that their funding is being cut without any additional aid as right now there doesn't stand to have any schools, public schools across the U S are looking at cutting funding by 30%, um, <clears throat> which means if they don't get crisis funding, there may be a loss of 300,000 teaching jobs. So I'm putting this out there. This is really significant. This is going to impact our children they're our future. We are our investment in them. You know, there are populations of kids where their parents are frontline workers. They can't afford to be at home. Their jobs don't allow them to work from home. And what are these parents going to do? <clears throat> it's just, it, it's just mind blowing. So the balancing of the budget is an issue right now for school systems all across the world or all across the U.S., there are additional studies and I want to share a little bit of some information. So we did just get, before I started, the jobs report came out 
So now in total of 10 weeks of this crisis, staying at home, furloughing employees, unemployment filings have hit the, a max level of 41 million individuals. 41 Americans have filed for unemployment in the last 10 weeks. That is mind blowing. <clears throat> and because of that, that's one of the reasons why we're going to see some funding dips. We're also going to see um, a Bloomberg. So Bloomberg released a study and I, I, I really appreciate them from an economic perspective. Um, one of the things that they put out the study, they, they have a whole bunch of stuff. So one of the things that they talk about is that the individuals like Brian and I, you know, I'm working from home. I have the luxury of doing that because I own my own business and also my clinic I run myself. So, you know, I have much greater opportunity to do that. And I also have an online related business like these live shows and all these other things that I do with other brands and teaching and, and things that are not dependent on me being one on one with individuals. But a lot of people don't have that ability. And what Bloomberg showcases in this chart are that the majority of the higher paid or highest paid workers, they actually have the ability to work from home. And so this is one of the factors as well with the reopening and things getting back to normal. Um, the income levels, you know, the lower socioeconomic income levels don't have that luxury. And so they're front and center and their risk factors increase as well. So it's just one of these vicious cycles. The other thing that Bloomberg reported, which, you know, as a female entrepreneur, and by the way, I got some sort of really sweet post. Uh, it was a hashtag WCW, apparently a Wednesday kind of highlight um, by a chiropractic facility out in California. So I was very excited I saw that show up on my Instagram feed. Um, but one of the things women are disproportionately being hit hardest, and I've mentioned this before, I've even highlighted some data, but this kind of breaks down just how hard the difference is in the genders and that women are bearing the brunt and the workers, the female workers, it's 53, this is worldwide. So they've done an assessment worldwide, 53% of women in the informal economy um, are deemed at high to medium high impact with the, the, just the, the impact of their jobs, changes in life, women are hit more disproportionately than men. And so like the difference, it was 53% women, 44% men. So that's a significant difference. Um, and some of the trades that they highlighted, manufacturing, auto repair, accommodation, food services, real estate, business, arts, entertainment, recreation, uh, transport, storage, communication, construction, financial services, like insurance as well, mining, quarrying, different agriculture, uh, social work, education, utilities, defense, administration, and compulsory social security. So across the board, women disproportionately are being impacted by this situation. Um, another thing that... Um, I want to highlight economically, and this was brought up by Bloomberg as well as some other research I, I did. Um, some of the changes to our day to day lives and our shopping and our kind of buying habits. This is kind of interesting. I love these little tidbits. They're like trivia details that might show up on a Jeopardy show. For instance, our grocery impulse shopping apparently has decreased by 30%. So people are buying less or fewer amounts of gum and mints. You know, all those like impulse buys they put at the you know checkout while you're sitting there. And of course, Gabriel is like, I want one of those. And I'm like, don't touch that. That stuff's junk. That's That, uh, that shopping is down by 30%. Um, on the flip side, apparently toothpaste and mouthwash is up by 12 and 13% respectively. And then nutrition bars, interestingly enough, uh, nutrition bar consumption is actually decreased by 19%. Part of that might be for people who work out on, are on the go and they're eating like a workout bar. Now, because we're working at home or have more uh, kind of use of our time at home or, you know, limiting our work time um, and, and also minimizing the social engagement of lunching. Uh, people are eating more foods that they they cook, which is good. There's a definite health benefit there. The other thing that I think is pretty substantial um, as far as the hospital element. So I want to go back to some of the hospitalization reporting. 
I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but uh, so the newest report is that a third of the hospitals, a third are not reporting the admission data for COVID cases. Okay, so like, let's just let that sink in. So we know that COVID deaths, I talked a little bit about that. Now, as far as people like you and I, we're like feeling, we're out of breath, we monitor, you know, we do a pulse ox, it's lower, we're coughing, feel like, okay, I think I might have COVID, definitely need some breathing support, you go to the hospital, you get admitted, only a third only actually only two thirds of the admissions are being reported. So there's a third of information and a third of data. So 33% of the individuals walking in to a hospital for whatever reason, only a third of that's being reported. I don't know why. I don't know if that's like a crisis in the, uh, the trans, the transmission of medical reporting, uh, Coding, I don't know what, I don't know why, but that's an alarming number. Okay. Um, And Carol says they are not coming in as COVID cases until they die. And that is very true because it makes sense. Also where Georgia was reporting, if, if, if you came in and you hadn't been tested, but you got tested while you're hospitalized, well, now you're officially counted, but you wouldn't be counted otherwise. Um, so I don't know. So what that means is we just don't know our caseloads. We don't know just how prevalent this is in our communities and our, at our local hospitals. So that's some news. Um, I also have some news here in Atlanta for any of you travelers, you know, Atlanta is one of the busiest airports and, uh, they're going to be rolling out in July, a new technology. It's called Colo. It's a smart monitoring system. It's by one of these like main kind of um, like digital engineering company things, but it basically is a hygiene technology tracker and it connects, this is kind of slick. It connects all of the like soap dispensers, the, you know, now all hands-free water and the air drying and the, you know, towel dispensers it has a connection to actually identify when those are getting low. And it also can track uh, now how many people have been populating that bathroom for cleaning purposes. So it's an, a way for these hospitals to reach highest levels of now required sanitation practices. Um, Atlanta is the only one right now rolling out this, it's a wireless facilities management system. It's being installed in all of our terminals. And it has uh, sensor technology with all these different bathroom fixtures. Then the other thing it will do is it um, connects up to the new, they're putting in 250 new hand, you know, uh, hands-free smart hand sanitizing stations. It'll also connect up to that. So if those sanitations are running low, they trigger to the main board and you've got people who are going there to fill those up so that we're constantly having sanitization. I think it's kind of interesting. Okay. So, um, I love that kind of information. And then, uh, there's a study that, um, came out. It is not identified what cruise ship was identified. Uh, It did end up, uh, at the end docking in Argentina. So I'm sure we could very easily find out, but uh, this one particular cruise ship, they tested all of um, all of the individuals on board, 80% of the population on board tested positive for the virus. Of those who tested positive, uh, there were 20, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to read my notes here. Um, 217 of the individuals tested positive. 128 of these individuals had symptoms. 104 of these individuals were not symptomatic. So it talks a lot about the role of the asymptomatic carrier, people not aware that they're sick, but they are spreading the virus. 
this is where there's talk today within a lot of governors to start mandating mask wearing. And I know we've had a lot of disputes, a lot of conversation about mask wearing, but this is why it's so critical. If you're asymptomatic, you're not feeling bad. You don't even know you have it. You get tested, you test positive and you're like, whoa, I felt fine. This is prevalent. So out of 217 people, and let's just take this to your business or your place of, of occupation. You're going back into the office. There's 200 people in your building out of the, let's say, just say 217, just for sake, 217 people in your building uh, out of those individuals that test positive, it'd be 80%. And then you have the breakdown. It is, is not evenly divided, but it's about 55% of those individuals are going to have symptoms. The other percentage do not. And so it's the folks who don't have symptoms that need to be wearing the masks more than anything, because if you have symptoms, you're, you're self-aware. I mean, I, people generally are like, I don't feel well. And when you don't feel well, and you're having symptoms of a fever, you're not working. You don't have that ability to, you stay home, you take a sick day, but when you're not feeling sick, you keep going. And that's the problem. That's why we need to have mask wearing. Um, so I think we're going to see more things kind of percolate. Um, there's going to be more anger. There's going to be more frustration. There's going to be more selfishness. There's going to be more communication about taking my rights away and you know whatever. But the reality is, if we want our economy to come back to some normalcy, we need to have that be a part of our daily practice. Lorian says, own my own travel business, and you would be shocked of the stuff that's not being reported in the travel industry also. Oh, gosh. Comment down below. Let us know. I love the inside scoop. And hopefully it's not anything crazy. Um, but I'm curious um, in terms of what isn't being reported. Um, so, Lori, and do you find that businesses are coming on board pretty easily pivoting uh, to address the new guidelines? Or are we seeing... Like we now know United and we also know American are packing people on the planes in ways that they really shouldn't just yet. So, okay. So I am curious what Lori's going to say. We have Eureka McIntosh. Hello. Good morning. Uh, Sunny M76. I hope so. Yes. Require mask. Good morning. K Diddy 44. See everybody on. Yay. And how, okay. So Angela says, I have over 600 in my work building and it's call center. So we can't keep masks on. We are all working at home now. I feel pretty scared to go back. I'm working on my immunity. That's good. Definitely work on your immunity, work on your inflammation. That's really big. Both of those are important. And if you have any underlying health condition, the immunity factor or the um, inflammatory factors, honestly, the most important part, because that's where we're seeing the, co the overwhelming compromising of the situ of the body. Taryn G, what happens to people who are asymptomatic? Do they take any meds? And is this very dangerous? No, they actually are. They're feeling like I feel fine. And so they, uh, some don't experience any symptoms at all, which is that's, that's, this is the hidden factor. This is the unknown of how many people in our world are walking around asymptomatic and they're hitting the grocery store and they're working and exposing others. Um, let's see, Anaga, doctor was having a hard time because of mass. It takes a lot of energy out of her. I totally get it. Um, and the mass thing too, I really feel like I need to do a video on this. I've had so many people say I feel dizzy and I start to have anxiety. It, it can trigger people. Um, and that is something that we need to address the emotions of, um, while also maintaining compliance. So, okay. Uh, I see 2009. Yeah. I had to go to a lab for tooth ceramic color match. Disgusting, disgusting. The color trays are just washed, just laying on the table. Oh man. Okay. So Lorianne says, well, people are booking a flight thinking seating on the plane will be spaced out and it's not that is just one thing. Yeah. So that's actually, we had one of our, um, yeah, Christine, Christine sent me a message on Instagram and she said, my American flight was booked at 85%, barely any empty seats. I think what we have to do is we just have to call that out socially, you know, take a picture of like that one guy and, you know, snap a shot and then post and tag. And I, I, you know, unfortunately I think because many of us are not flying, we're not all tuned in. Um, okay. So Let's talk about focus and recall. <laughs> this is a new, uh, new tropic. 
Um, but it's most importantly, a, a really intense nourishment um, and nutraceutical, if you will. But I want to talk about biohacking. So today's topic is specifically about biohacking as a way to increase your energy, your mental focus, improve your immunity, but, and most importantly, decrease your inflammation level. So there is this um, kind of newer wave of health professionals and health um, gurus um, that are doing this on themselves and seeing fantastic results. Clinically, we have some good labs and research on lowering cortisol levels, you know, burning fat more efficiently, metabolic balancing with metabolic syndrome, also changes to uh, the body's absorption of insulin and glucose, which means we have greater tolerance, which we're operating and working more efficiently, decreasing some of those underlying health conditions like diabetes and blood pressure. So biohacking, you can start biohacking on your own. There's a lot of different ways to biohack. One of the most common and very prevalent biohacks right now is keto. The keto diet's a biohacking tool. It's one of a multitude of resources, but you can uh, be able to turn off and disable some of the genetic predisposition you have to certain conditions by biohacking. And that's really what biohacking is, is it's a control of some of our gene expression or our gene likelihood. And we can tweak our environment, the body's environment to control that genetic factor. So it's a little bit of trickery when it comes to the body. I feel like I've been biohacking with my patients with, with regard to stress and cortisol, um, because that's a big underlying health condition that we just, we're not hearing any discussion about it. I have seen no research about cortisol and COVID and anything like that. But biohacking is a way for us to start to control some of the things that we feel like our body's out of control. And, you know, raise your hand, hit the little emoji. Give me um, the little, when you hit the emoji button, um, I have a uh, special, you, um, I have three different uh, natural health resource emojis. So hit those. Um, if you agree and feel like you need some biohacking or could benefit from a recalibration or reset control factor. So just a way to kind of get control. If you feel like your body's out of control, you've got health conditions that just, you know, like it just blows your mind, like how in the world I'm trying to do everything right. And it's just my body's melting down, hit those emojis and let me know if this resonates with you because biohacking can be beneficial. And there's a part of biohacking called nootropics. And so this is really new. I haven't done any, I haven't shot any video on this. So you guys are hearing it here first on my channel about this topic, but nootropics is this really unique world. There are so many variations of nootropics. There are natural, like adaptogenic herbs, like rhodiola, holy basil. I talk about those all the time. Those are adaptogens. They're in the nootropic category, natural. There are uh, amino acids we can use to balance neurotransmitters. That's considered nootropic. Then there are synthetic versions. Those are the ones that you want to stay away from. Um, when we talk about synthetic versions, th these are where we have people who've started nootropic supplement vendors or are doing this on their own and they're ordering materials from Russia or other vendors that it's not you know, we have no sort of quality control. We don't know the manufacturing. They're not testing for the ingredients. There's a scale. The, that synthetic scale is not what I'm going to talk about today. Oh, uh, Leticia, you're so sweet. She gave me another $10 super chat. Thank you. She says, Doc, good morning, Dr. Melissa. Thank you for everyone who's always in the live. Don't forget to thumbs up this video, sharing it and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So nootropics, you can utilize herbs. So in the world of kind of tweaking and kind of getting control of your body, you can use adaptogenic herbs like holy basil and rhodiola, and a whole bunch of others. You can also use uh, neurotransmitive, neurotransmitter balancers. That's part of the nootropics. Then we go a little bit further into um, you can go into phospholipids. So the idea with biohacking, it's full body. 
But there's an element where it's all about brain control. And, you know, we have control centers. We have our hypothalamus, our hippocampus, we have a pituitary gland, our brain, we have our neurotransmitters, we have all of these pathways. This is up here, the control center and controls everything in the body. So the focus is honing in on nourishing the brain. So phospholipids are plant-based healthy fats. That's a big part of the biohacking nootropic category, nourishing our brain with fat. Good fats lay the foundation. They're the building blocks for everything in our body. Without healthy fat, we can't make cholesterol. Cholesterol is needed to make estrogen and progesterone and all these other aspects within the body. But at the end of the day, the nootropics are focused on improving clarity, mental clarity, mental focus, mental acuity, um, improving the brain function, balancing and, and triggering our neurotransmitters to be optimally balanced. The good news is once you start doing this or add in like a supplement like this, you start to see the changes of all of this up here within the body. So you start to see the signaling improve, you start to see depression going down, lowering of anxiety, better mental focus. And what I love about incorporating biohacking is we have things already in our lives that we can implement. So let me share with you one of my favorite biohacks. And it would be, I haven't, I, I don't, haven't done it in a while because I'm just kind of giving it a break. But uh, for a while, kind of leading up to the whole wedding prep, I was doing keto in the morning. And so ordinarily, I would either have my keto coffee, I've highlighted that a lot, or I would have my keto bone broth. And so this is, this is right out of my freezer. So you can see it's still frozen. This is a bona fide bone broth. This I happen to get at Sprouts. So I've even had some of our Insta shoppers grab these for us. They're kind of expensive, but you can make your own. This happens to be a concentrated chicken bone broth. And it also has lemon, turmeric, coconut oil, and MCT oil. And instead of eating breakfast in the morning, this would be what I would consume. And then I would eat around, you know, lunchtime, early lunchtime. This 10, 10 grams of protein, it's zero, it's one on one gram on the carb front, uh, a little higher on the sodium scale, but it's, it's an okay salt. You're getting um, natural sea salt. They put lemon juice in this. There's a whole bunch of other things in it, but the keto diet is actually wonderful for balancing and resetting the body and the brain. And then adding in like the bone broth can be a way to really nourish the body. So that's the biohacking tip. Another biohacking tip is actually to do dry skin body brushing. So dry skin body brushing before you get in the shower, I have whole like tons of video content, just go into my channel and search dry skin body brush. And I have different routes. If you had mastectomies, I've got rerouting exercises. I go through that also in my healthy breast care course. I detail that a lot, but that's a good way to biohack your lymphatics, to get your lymphatics moving when it's sluggish. So that, that is one way. The other way is to really support the brain nourishment. And that's where this healthy cell. So literally, I just got this in the mail. I'm so excited. I've known that this has been on the docket and just been patiently waiting. And this is the mega box. So it's, it's a lot. I don't even know how many come in here. Let's see. 30. So this is a 30 day supply. You did this daily. You don't have to do this daily, but basically the same doctor that it created the REM sleep. You guys have, I've highlighted REM sleep quite a bit. They have the focus and recall and it is in the category of these nootropics, but healthier and cleaner. I don't get nervous with any of these products. I have patients that show me some of the stuff that they're taking and I, there's no regulation to some of what, what they're doing. And some of them are making their own pill packs, which ugh, that just freaks me out. But this has been formulated by Dr. Pompa. He is a, he's actually one of the leading stem cell researchers, stem cell doctors. He has a clinic in New Jersey and he has a clinic down in Costa Rica. And um, my friend, Kathy Smith, you guys know Kathy Smith. I was interviewed on her, her podcast in the fall, early fall, late summer. She worked with Dr. Papa and the amazing part about him is he already gets the stem cell requirement 
One of the things when people get stem cell implants or stem cell transfusions or however they're consuming it, sometimes we get it topically, sometimes we get it in injection, sometimes, you know, it's full fledged, like knocked out and all the joints and everything is injected with stem cells, either from our own body harvested from fat cells. That's really intense. This is a good way <laughs> to not have to go through that until we figure out a better way to harvest and implant our stem cells. But Dr. Pampa, this is his company. And the focus and recall is the name of it. It's kind of orange in its orientation, but it's all about supporting better focus, better, better mental alertness, and it nourishes the neurotransmitters. And so it's really, really wonderful. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about some of the ingredients here. And I want to answer some questions in harmony gal. Should you stay on keto indefinitely? Where do you get your carbs, which are also important for your body metabolism? So I personally am not, I don't do any diet per se, but I definitely was gearing up to be a little bit more svelte for the beautiful wedding dress that is like on its last and final <laughs> it's on hold for, uh, you know, 11 months now. Um, so I don't advise people to do it indefinitely. I do feel like we need an altered version. And to be honest with you, every three or four days doing something like that isn't a bad idea. Um, it can be very stressful to the body. And so I want to make sure people are doing things like taking this gel and taking the other nootropics like adaptogens to support that. Um, but carbs, healthy carbs tend to be where I go. Ancient grains, avocado, healthy fats, you can get some good density in your energy levels. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about what's in this. And because the font is so small, <laughs> I still haven't ordered my readers, I'm in total denial. Um, I'm going to read the box. So the box has, and I'll just show this to you guys. I don't know if this is inverted. It looks like it's inverted on YouTube, or on Instagram. But um, so the focus stuff, DM me, Monica, I've got a link for all of you in YouTube, you can click down below. Um, so the focus, it has aerial parts of an herb called um, Herpesia serrata, has magnesium, L-theanine, L-tyrosine, and L-glycine. Now, L-glycine, L-theanine, and L-tyrosine also you find in bone broth. So you're getting some of the benefit of like the keto bone broth that I like. But all bone broths have that. But you get higher doses like L-theanine, 200 milligrams. L-theanine is a very nerve tonic. It calms the central nervous system down. So a lot of you who have autoimmune reactions or even like the cytokine storm, there's this heightened level of inflammation and just alertness that the central nervous system is on. L-theanine is going to bring that down. Then there's three aspects for memory recall and rapid learning. They have D DMAE love that for energizing the body. They also have um, something called sharp PS. And it's a um, uh, phospho, let's see, phospho L to sterilene. Um, and then they have the alpha GC, which is a, a phospholipid. I love that. So you're going to get a lot of good brain nourishment, we need fats for our body to our brain to function. Our brain is water and fat. And that combination, we need all that we need good hydration levels daily for good brain function. And we need good healthy fats. The other thing for blood flow, it has curcumin, it has taurine, and then it has a natural caffeine, which I love. It's a coffee, uh, coffee, robusta extract. This is like your green tea. It's not one of those things that's going to exhaust your adrenals or overcharge rev up excite your central nervous system. So that's a good thing. Then it also has the brain cell uh, antioxidant and adaptogenic blend. So it has uh, Panax ginseng, which is an Asian ginseng. That's a wonderful adaptogen, especially for the brain. It has lutein and uh, zeoanthin, which is uh, fantastic for balancing uh, brain health. And then it also has black pepper. So you get that in the lutein is actually from marigolds. And then the cognitive fuel, you get omega-369, you get fatty acids, they're plant-based, 
Um, you get medium, uh, the MCT, the medium chain triglycerides, that's the coconut. So you get that kind of MCT aspect. And then you get a, a much more bioavailable. This is beneficial for all of my MTHFRs. They have a B6 and a B12 in the methylated version. Really great. So that's going to give you a lot of energy. <sighs> I'm so excited about it. It is very, very balancing, very supportive to the brain. You're going to get your neurotransmitters balanced with this. And this, you can couple up. You can take this in the morning, take REM sleep at night, and you are really balancing a lot of your body. Um, so that that's the focus and recall. Um, you know, the big thing here is it has antioxidants in it and amino acids that are very beneficial for helping the body balance glucose levels as well as minimize the insulin resistance. So that's huge. I also want to share with you some other biohacking tips. So a fun biohack, and this is something that, you know, probably will be quite shocking to a lot of people, but you know, when you take a hot shower in the morning, finish your shower on the super cold setting. And I mean, and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, like I love my warm showers. I'm all about hot, warm showers and hot baths. But the best way to biohack your body is after you're done with the hot, turn to cold. And, and I mean, it's going to be like, oh, oh my gosh, that shock. And it's not stress inducing. That shock is very good for your vascular channel. And the way I do it is I turn to my back and I have the water, cold water hitting here, which is the fastest way to cool down our body. So you get your carotid arteries, cold, cooling down. That is fantastic. That's a really good way to have, you get the dilation of your blood vessels and then the restriction that keeps our blood vessels mobile. And so anybody who has any family history of arterial sclerosis, you want to have that flexibility. And so by doing that and not, you know, just maintaining that kind of hot state, you cool them down. I do the same thing. I, I think I read this when I was like 12, I was obsessed with teen magazine and I've been making my own natural skincare since teen magazine. I, I, I want to say the first time I started reading it was like in fourth grade. So I was like 10. Yeah. Nine or 10. They told us way back then, like after you wash your face, warm water, close your pores with cold water. And I do that all the time. And I really feel like that also has helped my skin stay supple, you know, in my early forties now. So when we do that for the body, it's great. It'll lower blood pressure levels. It, while you're experiencing that change to the cold, it's pretty intense. <laughs> Bear with it. It's good for your hair. It's good for your skin. It's good for your body. When you get out, as you dry off, you start cooling down, you are going to feel so invigorated. It's such a fantastic balancer. Um, good. Christine does that. And... Christine Frecker says the cold water helps your hair too. It closes the follicles. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, we, we want to do everything that really helps our body. Um, the other thing that I have coming my way that I will be showcasing, not in a live video, but in a standalone video, um, is a sauna, uh, like a sauna tool. If you do any hot therapy, any sweating, detoxing like that, you have to make sure that you balance it with cold water. And um, every time I visit New York City, I love to go to the Russian baths. There's a particular place where it's even been in movies. And it's kind of funny because they they do like full on, like if you want, you can get the, um, the pine. I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's a particular type of like, I call it a thrashing. <laughs> so they literally take these tree, you know, the, like tree limbs and they've got particular type of pine and they will like whack your body with that. And it enhances your circulation. You do this in like the hot cave and you get that all done. You're like sweating. And then the pine oil really gets going. And then they have an element where they've got a 40 degree pool and you take a dip and then you stay in there until you feel like really intense. You come back out, you, you go back into the heat. You keep doing that. It's very healthy cultures around the world do that. We have, we've reduced that. We don't do that as much as we should. That's a biohacking tool. Um, I lived in Japan for a year 
every weekend, Saturday and Sunday, you went to the onsens. The onsens are the hot springs. They're like resort facilities. You go there and you soak in hot water and you dip in cold water and you go back and forth and back and forth and it's relaxing and you're there all day. It's fantastic. That is something you can do in your own house. If you take a hot shower or a hot bath, then the follow-up is you can take a cool bath or a cool shower. Um, but that balance is very much a biohacking tip. So those are some things I wanted to share with you. But, you know, biohacking, th there's all different types of biohacking. The more intense, the obviously way more expensive and more labor intensive in terms of the involvement. There are, uh, you know, local anesthetic uh, and uh, a ultrasound directed injection of stem cells that might not be your own. So harvested stem cells, there would be your own stem cells that get harvested by tra fat transfer. So liposuction is usually involved. Um, not everybody's a candidate for that liposuction. You have to qualify. Um, that's intense. Um, but definitely it's something to consider and we're going to see more biohacking information coming out. Um, okay. So that, that's really what I wanted to cover. I hope this was helpful. If you guys like this, please give me a thumbs up. Oh, I have to sneeze there. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Ah, uh, the allergies. It's pretty intense. The, the dogs, <laughs> my one dog came in yellow the other day. Mm. So that's our show for today. I have mommy camp time. I have a whole bunch of stuff arriving, more stuff in the mail, more stuff from eBay. Uh, if you guys are on eBay, I think my eBay name is granola mom or granola mommy. I can't remember. I was looking at it. Let me see. I think it's granola mommy. Let's see. I'm looking at my account, um, because I know you guys wanted that. So I'll make sure I, I get that specifically, but, um, we're getting, we're unloading a lot of stuff and actually I'm unloading some stuff from my clinic, uh, and products that, you know, just don't move or I've got here in the home and I'm posting. So it's just a lot easier to post it there. So do check out, do check out healthy cell. Um, they have where you can either buy a case of this, you know, this is, this is a lot. This is a single, single month supply Test it out. They, um, also have all the other products, um, in the clearing house. You guys know, I highlighted this a little bit. I use the healthy cell pro uh, as my main vitamin kind of source and it's particularly balanced, but this is really great. So if you're dealing with brain fog or you need to get back into the work mode, you know, cause we're all kind of in this home, it's a different schedule. So this can help you achieve that. All right. So, uh, Lorianne, anyone have lights of red light therapy? Yes. Yeah, so I actually, um, don't buy it just yet. I'm, that's what I'm getting. It's a, it's coming my way. <laughs> I'm very excited. So I'll dig into that because there are some resources that are better than others. Um, but definitely I will be getting into it. And the, the Russian bathhouse. Oh, so good. There's some movie. I can't remember what it was, but I remember going to the last time I went. I second to last time. This was like 2010, 2011. And I went to the Russian bathhouse. It was in February. And I was like, oh, it'll be great. It'll be cold outside. I'll cool down. I mean, I did the whole dips and everything, but like the oil from the pine is really detoxing. And we had tickets to one of the plays and I did not cool down. Um, you know, I put a sweater on and I had Jack and I was in a cab and like, I just remember burning up watching this one play thinking, Oh my gosh, I'm so hot. But seriously, amazing. If you guys have access to hot springs or, you know, Russian bathhouses, it definitely is, it's not what Americans are used to, but it's fantastic. You just have to kind of get aside that you're not wearing clothes and you're around other people, but all good. Now, COVID-19, we're not doing that. So you have to do this in the luxury of your own house. And so I'm definitely going to highlight a little bit about how I'm incorporating a particular tool that I will actually use in the clinic setting too. Um, but for now, it'll be at home. All right, friends. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Pat and Ron. And I hope the kitties are doing well. They're so cute. And I showed Gabriel and he wants, he wants kitties. He wants lizards. And now he wants, he wants two hamsters because they'll be friends. I think that's very sweet. 
So anyway, I'm glad this was eye opening. I hope, um, yeah, Korean bathhouses and like on the West Coast. Oh, it's so exciting. They have tons of stuff and even like onsens for the Japanese tourists. It's so fantastic. So definitely enjoy the rest of your day. Um, follow me on Instagram if you're not following. We're almost at 100 or 10,000 followers. Woo, woo, woo. So definitely tag, post, screenshot any part of our show. And thanks, everybody. Have a great day. I will see you tomorrow morning. Bye. Thank you. All right, YouTube. Thanks so much. Have a great day. See you later. Bye.